Field is on strike. The writers are on strike, and uh, nothing's getting made right now, or uh, or produced, or sent out. Now, for uh, those of you who uh, don't care, <laughs> eventually you're going to run out of stuff to watch. <laughs> it may take a while, but eventually you'll run out of stuff to watch. Uh, Martinsburg graduate Adam Jones is with us. You may remember him from the Hatfields and McCoys, which had Kevin Costner as its star. That's how we found him. And uh, we've been enjoying our relationship with Adam since then. Good morning, sir. Thanks for coming in. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. How you been? Pretty good. Not too bad. Uh, just, you know, right now it's a little bit of a a little bit of a slump in the uh, in the production of stuff. Right. Uh, there's still some stuff being made, but it's probably all non-union, very, mm -hmm. very low budget, kind of moderate stuff. But you now, know. I was in the, uh, the Writers Guild for about ten years yeah. and went through two strikes. And and one of the the issues, one of the the elements of joining the union, is if you if you have to certify that you have never worked during the period of a strike, even if you are not part of the union, and if you have, then you're forever banned from from the union. Is that similar with actors? Or can you? First of all, are you a SAG actor? Uh, no, I'm SAG eligible, which means I can right buy my way in. But since you're moment, not part of the yet. union, are you free to act, or is that career suicide if if you were to do that? I I wouldn't do it, um, just because I'm. I'm a member of the United Scenic Artists Guild mm -hmm. as a, another, you know, piece of work. So part of our contract is to we would support any other union strike, um, and we within our contracts we can work, but if there is a picket line, we can't cross that picket line. So on a day that a picket line would show up at a, a job, you just shut down that job for the day, and you wouldn't be able to you know, work there. But, um, and jobs were actually still continuing after May 2nd when the writers went on until SAG was striking. There was stuff that had been previously written mm -hmm. and that they could produce, they would uh, still continue working on. And then when, this, when the actors went on strike, it was like, now nothing is going to get done. And it's more visibility too, you know what I mean, for for everyone involved. This has been quite a blow to these folks because you had COVID, which shut down so much production yeah. for so long, and then you come right out of that, it looks like there's some momentum, and now boom, boom, double-edged sword with the strikes. Yeah, that's what, pretty rough. Well, what are the main issues as you see them, Adam? Uh, well, the main issues, I would say, are streaming residuals and AI on both accounts, both unions. Um, back, way back in the day, I think it was... 1960 that was when television was first being talked about in contract negotiations and that's when they got residuals um both unions for television production and when streaming was being negotiated back in the 2007 8 9 somewhere in that area mm -hmm. uh executives were basically like studio executives were basically saying oh you don't need residuals from streaming and so it sort of got pushed to the side and at that point in time, SAG and AFTER were not one merged union. They were separate for Screen Actors Guild and um, American Federation for Television, television and Radio, Radio, right? So the studios used them against each other. They negotiated separately mm -hmm. and had, even though some of their contracts are separate, they used them against each other by doing uh, negotiations with AFTRA first and then followed up with SAG. And so SAG sort of got a raw deal on residuals because... You know, and uh, after that, in 2012, they decided to merge the two unions. So that could never happen again. And studio executives tend to find ways of like, as you would in any negotiation that you're trying to win, find ways of like sweating people out or an angle that they can take that would benefit them, which is what happened. And they merge as a result. So much of this is, is driven historically, I guess, by technology, because I remember the yes. the uh, writer strike in late '90s, I think, uh, was driven that there were we as writers would get paid for videos that mm -hmm. were sold. Well, DVDs were not videos, right? So yeah. the argument by the producers was, well, we don't owe you anything for for DVDs, which is a silly argument. Well, you know, words mean things, right? I mean, you lawyers, what can you do? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, mm -hmm. and so th there was a strike there that actually was resolved 
pretty quickly. I think that only went three or four months. But the ones who ultimately suffer through all this is everybody else. The, the bodega down the street from the studios and the electricians who who aren't making, I mean, they make good money, but they're not making huge money. So all of the set workers that are just- All your crew, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're just, they're just bleeding money. And I- Yeah, the entertainment industry employs 4.8 million people. So it's, there's some people you know, I think SAG is, I don't, uh, Writers Guild represents like 11,500 people, and I think SAG and AFTRA is like 160,000. But that's only a small fraction of what that's affecting, you know? Mm -hmm. And most of those people are working a day to day, you know, job. And right now, from what I've understood, the studios don't plan on going back to the negotiating table with the writers, at least, until October. Well, they started in May. Mm -hmm. And each of them needs 28000 to qualify for health insurance. So they're sweating them out. You know, they're just making them last so long that they don't have money. They, they have to return to work in order to, you know, mortgages, health insurance, whatever it might be. So, so right, that's where they're at. Right now, when you say streaming at that time, the residuals weren't included with uh, streaming. Somewhat very minor, though, because it was considered... If you remember way back in the day, they were calling them webisodes yes. and web series. Mm -hmm. So they were not even qualifying as like regular series episodes or television episodes. It's before Netflix actually really boomed. It's right. like right around when YouTube was popping and they were trying to figure out how to define it because people were doing like, you know, 10 minute. Right. Well, so, so let me go back. The, the, I mentioned earlier, I started watching uh, reruns of a show called Suits, which was on USA Network oh, yeah. for like nine years, right? And, and I didn't know anything about it until one day a promo for it popped up on Netflix after I'd finished watching something else. It looked interesting, so I started watching Suits. Well, that was clearly commercial television at one point, and now it's Netflix. So are, are the actors who are in Suits uh -huh. getting residuals from Netflix now that that's on Netflix, or was so, that not part of their agreement? So it's a very good question. Um, I come up with one every now and then. It's volume. If I ask <laughs> enough, one of them's going to be good. No, let's go. It's a numbers um, game. So uh, it's it's hard to answer. And basically, the reason is is because streaming companies don't give out their their monetary earnings or or viewership. They it's not public. Mm -hmm. Just like television, we have the Nielsen ratings and all those things. We can determine what a a really dominant show is on network television and what isn't. So you would see where the money is going. Uh, with the streaming services, they don't, no one really knows except for the services themselves what they're making. So it's hard to determine who would get what residual. And right now there's no real defining factor within the contracts that actually points out what they would get. It's, it's, at a certain point, when streaming happened, you sort of, because it was its own thing and not in considered television, the streaming counterparts to the television uh, writers or actors would have to negotiate their own rates, which sometimes were way below what the you know contract minimum would be for uh, a television series on a network. Mm -hmm. And so you're sort of, it's like the Wild West. You know, you're going out, you're trying to figure out how the heck to you know, make what you, this person's making. Meanwhile, you could be working with a person doing the same job and they've negotiated lower or higher. So you're not even getting the same. It's it's a bizarre Wild West scenario. But how is that different than, I'm, I'm a novelist now primarily, and I negotiate a contract with a publisher that I'm going to guess, I don't know, but I, I certainly am not going to get Grisham money and I'm, I do better than most other authors. So everybody kind of negotiates their own level. Why isn't that appropriate within within acting and writing at for, for Hollywood? I mean, if, if, if it's a good enough deal to sign the contract, it's a good enough deal, right? So I would answer it as simple as this. There's a reason why we have a minimum wage in basic labor overall, so you cannot go below that. So streaming services, the problem is there was nothing really helping uh, to Were they stabilize not what that was. Um, man, that I can't answer offhand. Okay. I don't know. The because they're real production companies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But because it was because it was new media and they hadn't defined it, just like there was film and then television came along and they had to negotiate through it. And streaming was brand new and it was before Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, all the, you know, all the pluses that came out. There was no real 
landscape to worry about it. It was just little skits. Mm -hmm. And then after that negotiation, it built into this thing. And now it's one of the main ways in which people would make money, you know? So they've, they've had to renegotiate that. But as you're saying, like Grisham, so there is a, like a, I would say a hierarchy of competence or excellence. Like here's a base pay for everyone so that workers can't be exploited. And then depending on your marketability, talent level, name recognition, you can negotiate through the roof. This just guarantees a base salary for everyone, you know, kind of like a minimum wage would in, in broad labor. But that's that's one of the problems. And that's what they're trying to remedy here. And they're also trying to remedy AI is a big thing, too. It's like what streaming was when they were previously negotiating. They don't know where it's going to go. So they're trying to put in placeholders that don't allow studios to take advantage of AI in a way that replaces writers, performers. There's some proposals that will blow your mind. I'll, here, I'll tell you one. Here, let me find, let me get the exact, the exact one, because this is, okay. So, background performers, this is a proposal from one of the biggest studios. Which would we call extras? Background performers? Yeah, uh, I, I don't know how they're clarifying okay. it, but that's what, so, and I won't tell you what studio it is until until I'm done. So background performers would be scanned, get paid for one day's pay, and then their comp the, the company would own their scan, their image, their likeness, and they would be able to use it for the rest of eternity in any way they want without compensation or permission. Whoa. One day's pay. That's that abusive. better be a big day's pay. Yeah, to that's give good. up your that's a big number. That's that's what, a that's what, a big deal. That's yeah. basically so. In the future, you might benefit from having like a digital twin that could perform or go to press conferences in your stead or something. But not if it's not going to be compensated. That's still an aspect of you, an extension of you. You know, you would get paid a lower rate. Now, these are all things. A digital twin is like light years down the the road for negotiation, but. You don't want to give your likeness and image up in perpetuity for sure. nothing or for a day's pay. Yeah. That was Disney. I'll do it. I'll sign right now. Disney. <laughs> Rob, you can have it. I mean, for a, for a big. The can Mouse of House is Chef for a piece of contract. Yeah, I know. Disney makes great content, but some of their business dealings are a little rough. Apparently. That's, that's one in, in particular. So, what's the counter? Obviously, AI is going to exist. You can't. The, the genie's out of the bottle. Yeah. So what? What is? What's the actors? They have to. I presume they have to embrace the reality that this exists. So what's the alternative? That every, for example, for the every time the writers if, uh, for the actors. I'll have you unless you can speak equally. Um, obviously, if they scan my image, just let that go. <laughs> and, uh, and I could imagine every time they use it, then I would be paid for that use not paid full price you know not paid the same thing i'm done on the first day i don't know and then it depends it, on what they make you do doesn't it yeah i guess so i mean yeah <laughs> if they can control everything that happens with your image but i think part of the amendment there and by the way that was considered a generous proposal in ai land yes oh, wow. that was generous by the studios yes well I, the, well, the AM, amptp who who basically is the broker negotiating on behalf of all the studios I, I guess they could just say well we'll just create our own avatars with and that's right. we'll get nothing they could but they'd I, have to negotiate that again with some particular union because you're replacing the job of an actor anyway i i can see how there are some how, you know how, how they'd want to cut costs and save some money i mean i've got a neighbor who tried to make it in hollywood and he i think his his hand was on an escalator in the movie working girl or nine to five one of those type movies and every time that movie plays he gets a check for like a dollar and eight cents or something like that right that seems to be kind of ridiculous for the use of your hand <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what the contract said. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I guess, but that's the deal. I mean, it would cost more to process the check and send it than for him to actually, you know, get the dollar at eight. So I can understand where they're trying to rework some things. Sure. But taking your image for one day and then having the license to use it in perpetuity seems abusive. And creepy. And creepy. Right. Um, so reality TV is clearly not real. But but are those non-union? Is that is that a workaround? Now it's covered under the the union in terms of well writers 
and directors, I believe, but I don't think actors. I couldn't. I, actually, I can't speak to. I don't know how the actors are covered in reality. Well, reality wanna... shows like Cops don't have writers, right? But but others like Naked and Afraid. Which but if you look, but if you look at all <laughs> of them, show. you will find a story editor, that. perhaps a team of writers at the end credits. So it is being shaped. Oh, it's absolutely. like a documentary. Even if you shoot it, you have to shape it. But a lot of stuff is happening beforehand where they're orchestrating things to to create events that are spectacle to capture. Right. Nobody so. gets that unlucky rehab in a house that they find, you know, flooding and it's oh, it's been graffitied mm -hmm. while we were gone. Um, it's ridiculous. But so is, is there a hard time with the public enlisting sympathy for actors and writers? I mean, is there some sort of break that like everybody assumes these are just a bunch of rich people fighting over money? Well, I, I mean, that's a I think that's an absurd perspective for people at large to have only because you just how you're talking about how like maybe one percent of the people in this country are, are high earners right everyone else is still in the same pool of like you know just making ends meet and trying to get by most of your actors most of your crew members and writers and they're all just like you make trying to make uh you know their yearly bank in order to survive you know um, and then there's the people who, like I say, that that uh, hierarchy of competence where someone is like really excels at their craft and they're the people who are the one percent earning. That. So the people that you probably know the most, the most prominent people that you could probably name off the top of your like Brad Pitt, Margot Robbie, like any of those folks, they're making a lot of money. But everyone else is literally just like you they just do a job in the entertainment industry he, he looks at me when he says that he doesn't look at john gilstrap <laughs> i i think there's a messaging problem that though with with uh, these unions less so the writers because nobody knows who writers are anyway um but the the voices of the actor strike are the stars because they're the they're the stars right they, they attract the the mm -hmm. um attention the, the attention and it's really hard to look at somebody that's making 10 million dollars a movie that you know they're going to have to go for six months or a year without the opportunity to make a movie what they should be putting out are the actors who i, I won't name his name I, I know one who started as a child actor and he has eked out a living he lives in an okay house in la but that but that yeah. is his i don't know what he makes but it's it's more than subsistence but it's certainly not a, a wealthy lifestyle and through the strike if it goes too long he's got a lot of stuff to lose he's been doing it long enough that he's kind of got a strike fund in the bank that that he can pull yeah. off of um those are the people that that should be put out there there was a writer that was on um and having been a writer for a long long time in in, in both ends um nobody says that writing is your full-time job you know it can be and, and if you, that's what you want it to be god bless you but if you can't make enough money as a writer then go get another job while you're writing you know right? and right. so it i, I I think it's a it's a difficult message to getting what you're saying in terms of getting people to rally around show business people. It's a job that most people on the street would trade their fa their factory job for the perception of what people in the entertainment business do. Right. It's a, well, I, I and they may trade it legitimately instead of just what they think it is, because mm -hmm. it's not a bad job. It's yeah. a lucrative industry. And if stuff is being produced, you can do job after job, of, you know, and have continued employment. It is mostly freelance. That's one of the things that's different than most people's regular jobs is, you're, as you know, you're moving from job to job and not, you know, the consistency of the factory job where I go this time, I leave this time, and I know this paycheck. Yeah. And there's it's, no guarantee of the next job. That's right. Yeah. Uh, um, and I think, to speak to your point about actors and how they're promoted, I think, I don't know that people who weren't making a making a, let's say making a modest living as an actor would make a difference because I think people are I think audience members are are a little bit fickle and somewhat detached and judgmental of performers because there's there's this separation so I think ironically or sadly the people who are the ones they really want to watch if they're speaking out they're like yeah but you make millions and millions and millions and then if it's somebody who is making a modest living was a child star, you know, and is now doing it modestly, they would be like, oh, that guy, he fell out. Like, he's not worth listening to. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They would tend to dismiss it because of that separation of viewership to screen. It's like there's a disconnect. 
and and it's funny because when years ago like back in 2014 15 when the film tax credit was here and Stephen david was shooting a ton of stuff you could see people understand that film was a manufacturing industry and it wasn't this mysterious thing mm -hmm. that because it's replicating reality every job that exists in reality is needed on a film set so you have to you know and i think that um sort of uh thinning of the veil the mystique of hollywood and being able to understand oh we can be a part of this even if we don't know anything starting out as a pa or something like that i think that helps for people to connect when it's local when you can there's still you know spectator kind of stuff where people are like oh i just want to see what they're shooting but then there are people who get involved and be like i want to be a part of it mm -hmm. and i think then they start to realize a little bit of uh you know what 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 makes it an industry what makes it a job and not just a, a this mysterious thing that people get paid tons of money for because most of your crew members are not making they get an hourly wage Adam Jones is our guest. He's a Martinsburg High graduate. We first uh, started talking with Adam after the Hatfields and McCoys miniseries that starred Kevin Costner. Adam had a prominent role in that. And then uh, we started talking about some more nuts and bolts stuff like the West Virginia Film Tax Credit, which went away for a while, but you say it's back now. It did. Um, it was dismantled um, uh, less, less than 10 years ago, 2014, 15, somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. And then it's just been brought back. Um, I might mention just as a side note by the same person who dismantled it because who is, there's who, re-elections coming. Who is the person? Our, well, I don't want to. I know you, you. You don't like to go too political. So no, no, mention. we are. This is a political our, show. This is a political our, show. Our, our Welcome current, to the show. Our current governor. <laughs> oh, Jim our current governor. Yeah. Okay. It got moved. It's okay to say from. Uh, yeah, so the tax credit was left in place, but the film office was dismantled. So there was no one to actually implement the tax credit. Okay. And the following year, because the tax credit was not being used, because it couldn't be, it was like, well, this is a waste of money. It should go back into tourism and maybe to the Greenbrier. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but... Jim's, now, in, Jim's in town today, by the way. Good. I'd yeah. love to talk to him about this. The opinions expressed on this program may or may not represent the... No, but we, <laughs> well, we, we did a lot I of mean, programs on this. We did. I the, thought, but didn't the legislature have to have a say in sure. getting rid of it? Sure. Okay. I'm, uh, yes, absolutely agreed. But the leadership of the the state should be encouraging a, 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 an industry as lucrative as film yeah. when this is a you know at at this moment in our history we're a very low economic state in the listings of states and so if a, an industry is just coming and starting to grow that's as lucrative as this it shouldn't be dismantled okay it should be grown and it sort of you know stopped the growth of it and now like i said it's being brought back to i, I mean as i mentioned the reasons that doesn't really matter to me. It matters to me that it is back, that it's been you know brought back because it means economic growth for everyone. If you think so, film is like a win-win-win. When a film production comes here, they're going to do accommodations in hotels, even Airbnbs. If you know stars like I don't want to be in a hotel, they may put them up in Airbnb. So uh, there's restaurants, all your service provider. Uh, aspects, you know, any repair, any transportation, all that stuff. So, in, in, well, in addition to that, too, you've got locations. So even someone who's just living their life in their house and they want to put that house up on a locations uh, register on the WV Film website, if someone goes, that's the place we want to shoot, well, that person could very well be making money off of that just for living in their house, you know. Mm -hmm. And by way well, of scale on this that it brings to the area yeah but i'm sorry repeat the, the, plus the recognition that it brings to the area that's right that's right which is which is you can't measure that but it's i think it's huge in I, addition to crew members as well like yeah the, so the tax incentive works like it's 27 percent uh tax credit for qualified spends within the state meaning any business that you bring there's a tax return tax credit on it and then there's a four percent 
increase on that to 31% if you hire 10 or more local people on the production for the duration of principal photography. So it encourages also local hiring and things like that. Adam, uh, I can tell you where to go. 1230 at the train station. The uh, the governor is doing... Uh, <laughs> it's on Martin uh, Street. Go yeah. ask him. He's going to be doing the, the Department of Arts, Culture, and History, Randall Reed Smith, curator, presenting seven arts grants, one historic preservation grant in the Eastern Panhandle. So there's, that's a big thing going on today at 1230 at the train station. So you're suggesting there's, there's I go chance. down and have a chit-chat? There's your chance the... for art to art. He's a big dude. You can't miss him. I've seen him. I've seen him before. He has his own chair. No, it, 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 and I think you're you're right. In the fact, it's wrong to 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 say that he is 100 percent at fault or anything like that. It is the legislature. You are correct. Um, but like I said, it's 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 the timing of it and who is in charge of the state as a governor, and the fact that I, it just it's an odd timing to be up for reelection and be introducing the tax credit again. Hey, playing politics, baby. That's the way you get things done, right? This is your chance. Hey, uh, thanks for coming in. I'm good to catch up with you again, man.